Economic Club of Minnesota's mission is to provide a world-class nonpartisan forum for national and international leaders in business and public policy to discuss ideas that affect how Minnesota can better compete in the global economy. The Economic Club of Minnesota, engaging the world, strengthening Minnesota. I'm Tim Penny, together with uh, Mark Kennedy, co-founder of the Economic Club, and Mark did all the introductions earlier, so uh, my only responsibility at this moment is to introduce Vice President Mondale, who in turn will introduce our special guest, Governor Kuroda. It is most certainly a distinct honor, privilege, and pleasure to introduce Vice President Mondale to this audience. Vice President Mondo began his political career of public service to the state of Minnesota while he was still in college where he was among those helping to manage Hubert Humphrey's first campaign for the United States Senate. And as you know, Humphrey then went on to become a beloved figure not only here in our state but across the nation and internationally. And so Fritz can take some credit in launching that illustrious career. Fritz then went on to have an illustrious career of his own, started out in his early 30s as Minnesota's Attorney General, where he began to redefine the role of the Attorney General's office, expanding the role of that office into consumer affairs, a role that it continues to serve to this day. He served Minnesota in the United States Senate for 12 years, where he was well regarded among his colleagues, a mover and a shaker on a whole range of issues, but given the fact that my foundation in Southern Minnesota now focuses about half of its efforts every year on early childhood education, I want to specifically credit his leadership that many years ago in drawing attention to the importance of early childhood education for our country's future. He was selected by Jimmy Carter to be vice president and served in that role with distinction and is credited for redefining and strengthening the role of the vice presidency in American politics. And then he was called back into public service by President Clinton to serve for several years as the United States ambassador to Japan, where he worked diligently to strengthen that relationship, secure security agreements and trade agreements that were important to both nations and now upon his sort of retirement from public service, he still works uh, daily at Dorsey Whitney and is most certainly a Minnesota treasurer, but also a treasure to the nation and to the world. And I'm delighted to introduce him to then introduce Governor Kuroda. Thank you very much, uh, Tim, for those kind words. Uh, Tim Penny and I had the honor of serving together roughly in the uh, U.S. Congress for many, many years. He's an old friend, and it's an honor to be introduced by him. Uh, we're glad to have Coacher Lakota, the president of our uh, Minneapolis Federation, uh, uh, Central uh, Federal Reserve Board. Uh, it comes right off my lips so smoothly. Uh, but I, I admire what our president has been doing in that position, and I salute you. We have two consul generals here today. Um, Mr. Iwata of Japan, brand new to his office. I'm glad you came right to Minnesota. And Consul General Merchant of Canada, our good neighbor, we're glad you're here, and we appreciate your service. Uh, it is a great pleasure to introduce uh, the governor of the Bank of Japan, Harukiko Kurata. Uh, Kurata-san uh, is one of the principal figures in Japan, and at this crucial moment in uh, these economic challenges that we face together, he's a central figure not only in Japan, but to all of us. Uh, a few minutes ago, I was talking with Mira Hansen, the Honorary Consul General uh, for Japan here, and she told me something that I think is true. She said, I think 
Governor Kuroda's visit marks the visit of the highest ranking officer in Japan to Minnesota in Minnesota's history. So, <laughs> we know that you're a very wise man, and uh, if you could put a little sign in your office, Minnesota first, we'd appreciate it. <laughs> Uh, Governor Kuroda has been a strong figure in public life in Japan. And that's not true of all uh, officers in Japan who tend to be somewhat quiet and deferential. Not so with Mr. Kuroda. He has been a leading author of what you might call abinoc abinoc abinomics, which has a lot been to do to lift Japan from two decades of serious deflation. And many of us in this room uh, honor him for his leadership. Uh, before he became the central banker, uh, Mr. Kuroda had a distinguished career in the Ministry of Finance. Uh, uh, excellent education, he came up through the ranks, one of the stars recognized uh, early on in his career uh, became Minister of International, Vice Minister of International Finance, which is the highest position for a career officer in the ministry, and uh, was recognized by this group of gifted career officers as their star. And he, he was he'd been there. For, he was there during the time of the. Uh, Asian financial crisis and contributed much to the solution of that problem. Since 2005, or in 2005, he became the uh, president of the Asian Development Bank located in Manila. And during his some eight years there, the longest period for a president in that position, he doubled the activities of the ADP its assets, its involvement, its scope of activities. And when he stepped down there, he left a, stark, a, mark, a remarkably different uh, institution, much more capable of helping us. And as the ADP grew, grew dramatically in stature, uh, Mr. Kuroda had a lot to do with that much needed reform. He's now, as you know, the central banker of Japan. This is a crucial position, and in it, um, Mr. Kuroda has shown special leadership skills. He speaks out on the issues, he debates the questions, he's respected in the highest offices of Japan, he works closely with the Prime Minister, Mr. Abe, and we know that what happens in Japan affects all of us. For the United States, Japan is one of our key allies, our key partners, key uh, operators together in trying to make this a better and more safer uh, world, more prosperous world. And so please join me in welcoming this remarkable citizen to the podium. Thank you. It is, uh, of course, a great pleasure to speak at the Economic Club of Minnesota. I would, uh, first of all, uh, like to thank uh, Mr. Walter Mondale, a former Vice President of the United States and Ambassador to Japan, for the very kind introduction. Also, I deeply thank Mr. Mark Kennedy, Chairman of the club, and President Kocharakota of the Federal Reserve Bank of Minneapolis for inviting me to the Twin Cities in April not in January. <laughs> uh, I assume many of you are aware that Japan has been suffering from mild 
but persistent deflation since the mid 1990s. While I'm not going to uh, going to go into the reasons for Japan's deflation, but let me point out one simple fact, namely that it lasted for almost two decades. During this period of protracted deflation, a deflationary mindset took hold among the public, that is, the belief became entrenched that prices would not increase but continue to steadily decline. Once this deflationary mindset had taken hold, people engaged in economic activity assuming that deflation would continue. As a result, the economy fell into a sort of vicious cycle of decline in prices, a decline in sales and profit, stagnant wages and consumption, and a further decline in prices. In this way, deflation in Japan perpetuated itself in a self-fulfilling manner. Unfortunately, deflation is no longer a phenomenon that is unique in Japan. In the euro area, the year-on-year -year inflation rate has been negative for the past several months. Even in the United States, as noted by President Kocharkota on several occasions, inflation has fallen below the 2% inflation target set by the Federal Open Market Committee, creating a risk to the credibility of the target. These developments highlight that a number of advanced economies are now facing the risk of very low inflation or even deflation. The good news from Japan is that quantitative and qualitative monetary easing, or QQE, implemented by the Bank of Japan is having the intended effects, and the economy is making steady progress on its way to conquering deflation. QQE aims at affecting firms and households' inflation expectations and re-anchoring them at 2% through the bank's strong and clear commitment to achieving the price stability target and large-scale monetary easing to underpin the, uh, the commitment. In the aftermath of the global financial crisis, central banks around the world adopted a variety of non-traditional monetary policy measures. Yet, it could be said that even among these, the configuration of QQE is quite innovative. I hope that by succeeding in getting the economy out of deflation through QQE, the Bank of Japan can provide a case, a case in point that it is possible to overcome deflation through innovative monetary policy. Today, I would like to talk about inflation expectations. Inflation expectations are very popular, a very popular phase, phase among central bankers and economists, but may not be so for the others. Thus, let me explain the basics of the concept first. Simply speaking, inflation expectations mean how people think prices are going to be. If many of them <coughs> think prices are going to go up and behave accordingly, then actual prices tend to go up and vice versa. Thus, it is very important for central bankers to make people believe prices are going to be stable, in other words, to maintain inflation expectations in order to achieve their mandate of price stability. A notable example is Federal Reserve Chairman Paul Volcker's bold action to substantially lower the inflation expectations in early 1980s. I will touch on the case later. The importance of anchoring inflation expectations has been fully acknowledged by at least economists and central bankers. However, 
because inflation has been stable for long time in most advanced economies, including the US, inflation expectations has been always referred to as being well anchored. Uh, I recognize that as the Bank of Japan proceed with uh, QQE, both in terms of academic research and central bank policy practice, various important issues with regard to inflation expectations need to be further explored. Against this background, I'll talk about three issues about inflation expectations, namely, one, how to assess inflation expectations, two, the expectation formation mechanism, and three, policy measures. A natural question that arises is how to assess inflation expectations. While expectations are inherently unobservable, there are a number of indicators that we can rely on. These can be broadly divided into two types, uh, market-based and survey-based indicators. Market-based indicators reflect the collective view of market participants. A well-known example is the so-called break-even inflation rate calculated from yields on Treasury inflation-protected securities. Such indicators provide useful information about inflation expectations, in part because market prices are updated frequently. On the other hand, survey-based indicators also have their advantages. For example, they can be used to examine changes in the distribution of inflation expectations over time, providing critical information for the conduct of monetary policy during periods when expectations are changing considerably. In this context, allow me to remind you of the so-called Volcker disinflation. Professor Gregory Mankiw and his colleagues noted that during the period of Volcker disinflation, the inflation expectations of responded to the Michigan survey did not change in a uniform manner. Uh, if you look at the <coughs> uh, top left panel of the chart one, uh, prior to the announcement of the new policy regime in 1979, the distribution of respondent, respondents' uh, inflation expectations followed a uh, bell curve, bell-shaped. Uh, following the commitment of decisive monetary tightening, as shown in the middle panel on the left, the survey distribution as a whole shifted leftward and dispersion increased, indicating significant disagreement among respondents in terms of their inflation expectations. During the transition period, the distribution displayed a bimodal shape, reflecting different expectations by two separate groups, those who believed in the regime change and update their expectations, and those who did not. Over time, as indicated in the bottom left panel, the distribution changed into a new bell shape with a significantly lower mode than during the pre volca period. Perhaps you may be interested in what household survey data for Japan suggest with regard to inflation expectations over the past two years. As you notice, uh, when you look at the right-hand side panels of chart one from top to the bottom, what these data indicate is that since the introduction of QQE, the distribution of inflation expectations has generally become less and less dispersed or more and more uh, skewed over time, with more and more households expecting prices to rise at an annual rate of 2% as they look ahead. The bank has been making continuous efforts to better assess inflation expectations by collecting a wide range of information. 
It has published household survey data <coughs> on a quarterly basis. In addition, the bank has recently added questions regarding firms' outlook for inflation in its long-standing business survey called the Tankan, or short-term economic survey of enterprises in Japan, which covers more than 10,000 firms. As data accumulate, these will provide us with useful information on inflation expectations. The information set based on which firms and households form their inflation expectations includes the central bank's target rate of inflation, present and past developments in the inflation rate, and so on and so forth. Strangely, the mechanism through which inflation expectations are formed has not been fully analyzed. With inflation in the euro area having fallen into negative territory, whether and how this might trigger inflation expectations to become de-anchored is a pertinent question. A deeper understanding of the mechanism underlying expectation formation will likely also be useful for designing appropriate monetary policy measures. Let me introduce you an interesting analysis uh, on this topic. In a recent study, Mr. Jeffrey Fowler, Executive Vice President and Senior Policy Advisor at the Federal Reserve Bank of Boston, using US time series data, finds that past inflation accounts for about 40% of the variation in four-quarter inflation expectations. Looking at data for Japan, similar reduced form regression tend to find that past inflation accounts for a significantly larger part of variations in inflation expectations. These contrasting results suggest that inflation expectations may be better anchored, that is, less susceptible to development in past inflation in the United States than in Japan. As implied by Mr. Fowler's analysis, people update their expectations about inflation through observations of past inflation data. To better understand the dynamics of inflation expectations, it may be useful to incorporate Bayes' rule or Bayesian updating into investigating how people revise their expectations over time. Based on the Bayesian approach, one could examine the extent to which the inflation target set by a central bank, such as the 2% target adopted by the Bank of Japan and other major central banks, including the Federal Reserve, has gained credibility among the public. As chart two uh, uh, in the handout uh, shows, in the context of Japan's experience, since the introduction of QQE, a variety of indicators of inflation expectations have been rising in tandem with the rise in the consumption price index inflation. A possible interpretation of this relationship between inflation expectations and development in the inflation is that typical Bayesian updating is at work. In non-technical terms, the unprecedented uh, strong commitment to the 2% target by the Bank of Japan from the outset bolstered its credibility, or in technical Bayesian terms, I'm sorry to say such technical matters, uh, <laughs> in technical Bayesian terms, the commitment affected prior beliefs, prior beliefs regarding the long-term inflation rate. Subsequently, with the CPI inflation registering consecutive increase or increases, people's belief in the target has been strengthened further. In other words, the likelihood that long-term inflation in fact will be 2% is now perceived to be higher. Given this increased likelihood, People in turn regard it as more likely that the bank will achieve 2% inflation. In Bayesian terms, the posterior, uh, posterior belief has been updated. 
The feedback loop among player beliefs, the likelihood and posterior beliefs is the basic mechanism underlying Bayesian updating. In the context of the transmission mechanism of QQE, the strong commitment raises people's prior belief in the 2% inflation target and people revise their inflation expectations upward as they observe the actual CPI inflation increasing. The Bayesian updating process fits well with what has been taking place in terms of inflation and inflation expectations in Japan. Thus, the mechanism of QQE can be comfortably interpreted as a certain type of learning by doing process. My hope is that there will be more research in this direction in the future. When a number of central banks, including the Federal Reserve, combated high inflation in the 1980s and eventually successfully conquered inflation, this was in no small part due to the application of de facto flexible inflation targeting. At the same time, it should be acknowledged that alongside the simple setting of inflation targets, careful use of operational tools and effective communication played an important role. Then Chairman Volker's efforts to improve communications between the Federal Reserve and the US uh, public are reflected in his well-known speech titled, A Time of Testing, delivered in 1979. Its challenge was to tame high inflation in the face of high unemployment. In contrast with the challenge of high unemployment faced by the Federal Reserve in the 1980s, unemployment, fortunately, is not an acute issue confronting the Bank of Japan today. Instead, the bank's challenge is how to raise inflation expectations with nominal interest rates at the zero lower bound. Despite the different nature of challenging challenges facing the two central banks, the most appropriate policy response chosen both in the United States and in Japan is a goal-oriented one. Moreover, just as in the days of Chairman Voruka and others in the 1980s, the Federal Reserve and the Bank of Japan are experiencing a time of testing today. Let me now turn to our challenges more in detail. As I mentioned at the outset, a deflationary mindset had taken hold in Japan during almost two decades of deflation. Against this backdrop, the bank em embarked on QQE, aiming to achieve the price stability target of 2% or inflation target of 2%. Our strategy consisted of two pillars. First, a clear commitment to the 2% price stability target. In fact, the bank had made two types of commitments, namely that first, the bank will achieve the price stability target of 2% in terms of the year-on-year -year rate of change in the consumer price index at the earliest possible time with a time horizon of about two years. And second, the bank will continue with QQE aiming at achieve the price stability target of 2% as long as it is necessary for maintaining that target in a stable manner. So that uh, our QQE is like uh, QE3 in the US, uh, open-ended. Now, the second pillar of the bank's strategy is large-scale monetary easing to underpin the commitment, specifically the bank has been conducting massive purchases of Japanese government bonds to exert downward pressure on nominal interest rates across the yield curve. In fact, the size of these asset purchases dwarfs the large-scale asset purchase program in the US. As a result of these purchases, the nominal our monetary base to GDP ratio in Japan has now reached around 55%, while the equivalent figure for the US 
is around 20%. Rising inflation expectations mean that there has been room for real interest rates to decline further. This in turn implies that zero lower bound on nominal rates is not an insurmountable constraint on central banks' ability to influence real interest rates through monetary policy. The decline in real interest rates has stimulated private demand such as consumption and investment. The boost to private demand has led to an improvement in the output gap, which in turn has led to an increase in the actual inflation rates. And observing the increase in actual inflation rates, the Japanese public has become increasingly convinced that the bank can achieve the 2% inflation target. This positive feedback loop has been operating since the bank introduced QQE two years ago. Thus, the mechanism envisaged by the bank has been working as intended. As a result, your annual CPI inflation, which, has, which was hovering around minus 0.5% when the bank embarked on QQE, turned positive after several months and remained around 1% for more than a year. Although the CPI inflation has declined to around zero, mainly reflecting the significant decline in oil prices, there is no doubt that the underlying trend of inflation has improved markedly. There are a number of indications that in deflationary mindset that have taken hold in Japan is subsiding. A prime example can be found in the labor market. In Japan's labor market, there is a long-standing tradition of conducting wage negotiations between workers and the management in a certain way. These wage negotiations, the so-called spring offensive or shunto in Japanese, take, uh, take place in a synchronized manner every spring across industries. The practice of Shunto is said to date back to the 1950s. But since uh, 1990s, that is for nearly two decades, base pay, uh, base pay during these negotiations has uh, stagnated. And yet, in the 1940s Shunto, base pay was raised at many farms for the first time in about 20 years, and it looks likely that it will rise at even more uh, farms in this year's round. These recent labor market developments provide evidence that Japan's almost two decades of deflation are about to come to an end. QQE is starting to achieve what some may have thought impossible. If Japan can successfully overcome deflation and re-anchor inflation expectations, as it is now in the process of doing, this will represent a major step in monetary policy history, not only in Japan, but also around the globe. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you much. Uh, thank you very much, Governor Kuroda. It was um, a very good exposition of the challenges uh, facing Japan at its current point in monetary policy, and also uh, the successes that have been enjoyed over the past two years in, in uh, addressing those challenges. Uh, I'm going to be, I'm uh, Nariana Coach Lakota, the president of the Federal Reserve Bank of Minneapolis, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and I have the honor of taking a few questions from the oh, audience. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, then uh, sure. uh, I, I'll, uh, t as, uh, as a moderator, I'll take off over the privilege of asking you the first question. <laughs> yeah, yeah, please. <laughs> um, and my question is that we, you, you explain the challenges facing Japan very clearly to the audience. Uh, but of course, as a, a central banker in a country that is intimately linked to our own through uh, trade and other uh, relationships, mm -hmm. I'm sure that uh, it's very important for you to have a, a, an outlook for the U.S. economy as well. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering uh, what your thoughts are on the outlook for, for our economy. Mm -hmm. 
Thank you very much uh, uh, for uh, your raising a very important question because uh, at this moment, it is the U.S. economy which leads the global economic recovery from the so-called uh, Great Recession. Uh, before coming to Minneapolis, I was in Washington, D.C., where a number of international meetings were held. And uh, naturally, we discussed about the U.S. economic outlook and so on and so forth. Uh, personally, I think uh, the first quarter uh, of this year, uh, uh, real GDP growth may be somewhat subdued, uh, around 1.5%, one, one uh, because of bad weather. And I understand uh, some strike in the West Coast, uh, and so on and so forth. But from the second quarter onward, I'm reasonably sure that the U.S. economy could achieve around 3% growth. Uh, so um, I think the U.S. economic recovery is uh, quite solid. Uh, and uh, and uh, the U.S. economy will continue to lead the global economic recovery. Uh, at the same time, uh, as the latest uh, World Economic Outlook uh, uh, paper uh, issued by the IMF shows, uh, the Eurozone is gradually recovering. And as I said, the Japanese economy is also recovering. So U.S. Uh, leading the recovery and uh, followed by the Eurozone and Japan uh, mean that uh, the developed economies uh, would be uh, leading the global economic recovery. At this stage, uh, <coughs> many uh, emerging economies uh, are experiencing some slowdown of economic growth. But uh, like IMF, I also think that uh, eventually the global economy would uh, make a strong uh, uh, economic growth, first led by developed countries like the U.S., but followed by a uh, strong recovery by uh, emerging economies. Thank you. So uh, at this point, we'll th uh, throw open the floor for questions. I think there are microphones around. So if you wouldn't mind waiting for the microphone to come to you. Hello, thank you very much. How much do you think the level of a currency mm. has on current or future inflation mm. expectations? Mm -hmm. Again, uh, this is an issue uh, very much discussed in uh, Washington, D.C. Although uh, this time uh, exchange rates uh, were not so much discussed uh, uh, as in the past, uh, partly because, uh, uh, I mean, the dollar appreciated uh, substantially against uh, major currencies, including the euro, yen, even against the uh, renminbi, and against almost all emerging currencies. But uh, for the time being, uh, or at least in the <coughs> uh, uh, very recent uh, uh, months and weeks, uh, uh, such uh, rapid appreciation of the dollar uh, appears, um, if not uh, completely uh, uh, <coughs> stopping, but uh, decelerating. And uh, so exchange rates uh, were discussed, but uh, not much uh, this time in Washington, D.C. Of course, exchange rate uh, <coughs> movement uh, would affect uh, domestic uh, uh, inflation uh, as well. Uh, so uh, uh, in the U.S., uh, uh, substantial appreciation of the data uh, taking place last year would have some uh, negative impact on uh, inflation rate, while in the Eurozone, with substantial uh, depreciation uh, recently, uh, <coughs> could have uh, somewhat uh, uh, 
upward uh, pressure on prices. On the other hand, the, the yen uh, depreciated uh, substantially in 1913, uh, but in 1914 uh, depreciated uh, not so much. And in uh, 1915, yen has stopped uh, depreciating or slightly appreciating. So those inflation uh, rates in <coughs> uh, three major economies, US, Euro, zone, and Japan, could be affected by exchange rate movement. But uh, two things I can say. First, uh, central bank's uh, monetary policy in the three major economies uh, is not targeted at the inf uh, exchange rate. It's targeted at the inflation rate. Second, uh, as I said uh, already, uh, dollar appreciation, uh, if not uh, has stopped, but uh, dollar exchange rate appeared to be somewhat uh, stabilizing. And, uh, and personally, <laughs> personally, I don't think uh, uh, <coughs> dollar will continue to appreciate uh, as it appreciated uh, in the last year. Of course, uh, famous dot chart <laughs> shows that, uh, that uh, uh, FOMC members uh, think that the interest rate would go up like that, while the market expectation is lower. And if th that is the case, and if uh, interest rate in the US uh, go up as FOMC members uh, uh, <coughs> show, uh, then market would be surprised. and. Uh, further appreciation of the dollar may take place. But if you look at Japan, then you can also find that market expectation of interest rates in coming years are so low. While we expect, as I said, we can achieve 2% inflation target in fiscal 2015 or early fiscal 2016, that means that interest rates should gradually go up. <laughs> so uh, similarly, the, the Japanese market could be surprised. Uh, these two surprises could uh, cancel out. <laughs> so I, <laughs> I, 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 I mean, in the Ministry of Finance, uh, I was involved in, involved in exchange, exchange rate uh, uh, policy, exchange market intervention, and so on and so forth. And my <coughs> uh, <coughs> take, my experience uh, in, in the area uh, <coughs> showed that uh, exchange rate is difficult to predict. And it's better not to say anything about exchange rates. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you again very much for, for, your, for your excellent presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The Economic Club of Minnesota's mission is to provide a world-class nonpartisan forum for national and international leaders in business and public policy to discuss ideas that affect how Minnesota can better compete in the global economy. The Economic Club of Minnesota, engaging the world, strengthening Minnesota.